Nation of Turned Out of Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham, and once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had the life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, a Toronto legend, former booker of Club Shanghai, former booker of the Elma Combo, former booker of the Silver Dollar, currently booking the Monarch Tavern in Toronto, Dan Burke is on the show. And if you are from this city, you have heard, we probably played shows for Dan or every band kind of played some of their first shows with Dan, or you've heard legends of Dan, or maybe you've seen some of the YouTube videos of Dan Burke over the years, but oh my gosh, this might be one of the wildest episodes I've ever done. More on that in one second, but first, to get in touch with me, hit up the email address, turned out of punk podcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham, and he will get the message to me. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram at left for Damien. There is also a YouTube page, an Instagram page, a Facebook page, and a TikTok page, all for this podcast. And all could be found at turned out of punk on those respective platforms. And, uh, and yeah, that is that. I play in a band. We are called fucked up. We will be going on tour. If you're listening to this, when it drops, we are, we're currently on tour over in Europe. You can find out more information at fuckedup.cc. We also have a brand new seven inch called show friends, which, um, um, write me and tell me what you think what the lyrics are about. Some people have written me and speculated what the lyrics are about. And, uh, some people have gotten it, but over there at fuckedup.cc, you can order that record and find out the show dates. We're playing with off and dinosaur junior and collapse and a lot of great bands. I'm looking forward to this little tour and hopefully I see you out there on the road. All right, on to today's show. As I said off the top, this is a big one. This is a wild one. Dan Burke is on the podcast today. Now, Dan is someone, once again, as I said off the top, that if you are from Toronto, you definitely know who Dan is. If you're not from Toronto, you might have heard some of the legends or seen some of the YouTube videos. There's, of course, the infamous John Dwyer fight video. There's the Jay Riotard fight riot video. There's Gosh, countless more. There's also a fantastic documentary. Like this this episode, Dan goes into his whole life, and his life is, as you'll hear, quite harrowing at times. There is a fantastic documentary that came out last year called Kings of Coke, about the cocaine trade in Montreal in the 70s. And Dan, as in his former life as a reporter for W5, is featured quite heavily in this documentary. And so if you want to see, I guess, the... Uh, the prologue to this episode, go out and watch that documentary. And it was produced by Michael Cronish, who's behind uh, the person who greenlit the TV show, The Wrestlers, that I made way back when. So it all goes full circle. Also gave me my copy of the Asexual 7-inch. So shout out to Michael if he's hearing this one. Uh, this is a, yeah, I'm not going to ramble on too much. There's some stuff in this episode which is kind of upsetting and kind of, um, we're just upsetting and I hope this episode serves as a cautionary tale. No judgment on anyone. Whatever drugs you you do, whatever drugs you, you lean on for relief, no judgment. But at the same time, there is a cost. And before you start doing these drugs, if you have the ability to kind of stop and think, maybe, maybe think back on this episode and think back on some of the stuff that Dan says in this one. All right. I... I I kind of want to ramble on more and, and hype this up more and give you some more pre-story, but this one's too good to kind of wait on. If you want to find out more about what Dan's up to currently, and as I say in this episode, Dan has an incredible ear for music and is someone who constantly discovers bands from this place. Well, not even from this place, from, from all over the place, as you'll hear on this episode. Like We're talking about the guy who did the first Toronto show for the White Stripes when no one cared. Like <laughs> No one cared back then. And also did the first show for Pup. And also did my old, old band's first show, weirdly, as we talk about. But you can find out more at Dan underscore Burke underscore Rockscar. And uh, there's shows that he's got coming up. Uh, once again, at the Monarch Tavern. He's got a class of 2024 series coming up. Uh, and great bands always on that. And always finds, as I said, the next big thing. Well, I'm not going to ramble on anymore. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Dan Burke on Turned Out a Punk. Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to uh, to be here. 
at this age. I'm 65. Well, it's an honor to have you here at 65 because I knew you when I was 15. When I, I think when I first met you, and you know, yeah, I, I remember the first yeah. time. I, yeah, uh, you, were, I, you were helping uh, Jeff Cohen uh, yep. broadcast uh, Mods and Rockers. Yeah, at uh, the CIUT, uh, Toronto University of Toronto uh, radio station studio. And that's a, I, I was a new kid on the block. I, I was not a kid, but I was definitely new on the block as a, um, a club owner, actually a part owner at that time, and a uh, promoter. Um, and I walked in, see if I could get some help promoting a show or two from you guys. Well, yeah, because I remember you showed up in town out of kind of, you know, later on, I would find out more about your history, obviously. Out of through nowhere. Knowing, out of nowhere. Yeah, totally. And and you came in and uh, you changed Toronto. You know, like you brought a little bit of Montreal to Toronto in a, in a big way. And a lot of the bands and a lot of the stuff you were booking in retrospect it, you you were right. You know, history proved you right about a lot of these bands that you were championing long before anyone else was. And I think I remember you doing that question mark in the Mysterian show and also High Five and the Road Burners. I remember those two shows happening kind of close together. And those being Plus, like, you like you like the question mark show? I did that twice. I, I first that first at Club Shanghai. Yep. Yeah. And uh, then I did them at the Elma Combo. When I had taken over as a, a booker promoter, the chief booker promoter of the Alma Combo, and that that show, that lineup, was a masterpiece, if I may say so. It was question the mark, question mark and the Mysterians, the Sadies, and for the opener, I went to a band I knew from Cincinnati, the Greenhorns who later became uh, Jack White's uh, house band or several members of the Greenhorns. And uh, anyway, I, I, who would have brought in a band from Cincinnati <laughs> for an opening slot? But I was into putting together these, these, um, I, I, I show is almost like an album or, or a song. Mm -hmm. You've got a, a, a you know, a, a verse, bridge and um, chorus, you know? It's 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 um there's a bit if you take it seriously, there's a bit of a construction to it and you can uh, an equation to it, and you can create some beautiful things sometimes, you know. Oh, especially absolutely. when especially when the first band kicks ass because um that raises the um that raises the level, the standard for the evening, and more often than not. The, the the following bands feed off it. So when that first band comes out, I've had bands uh, uh, come out, at, like middle bands, come out and just kill it. Remember CPC Gang Bangs? From Montreal, um, absolutely. Yeah. Came out, they were opening for uh, at the um, at the Silver Dollar. And um, they went on and I says, holy jeez. I can't see Jay following this. And actually, in that case, he did. He folded about three songs in. There was some violence, and that was that was the night I, I was a bit loaded myself. And I got on stage and jumped into the audience, got in a fight with some. Oh God, a fiasco. Any, anyway, that, that 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 that's not the best example for uh, what I'm talking about. Is is putting constructing a show which um, uh, is greater than the sum of its parts. And, and I try to do that sometimes. I did it with um, uh, Didi Ramon, too. Mm -hmm. I Didi Ramon uh, and with Marky on drums. And I was at the Elma Combo in uh, 2000. I, yeah, 2000. And um, I brought in the Toilet Boys from New York City for it. And if that wasn't enough, I brought in Tricky, Tricky Woo from Montreal to open up. And I think it was a Tuesday night. Yeah, it was. I was anyway, there. I remember when, <laughs> when I opened the doors, when I opened the doors for that show, the advanced ticket revenue paid off 
the American Canadian exchange on the uh, DD Markey guarantee. That's it. <laughs> and I, I'm like, oh my God. He opened the door, it was like nine o'clock in those days, even on a weekday. And there's nobody in the room. <laughs> I mean, you got to make about three thousand more dollars, and I'm like, oh boy! And and actually, it did splendidly the night, but uh, I was sweating going in. I, I'd overloaded the I'd overloaded the support slots, uh, but uh, anyway, those were great bands. That was an incredible show. I remember that show, uh, and it was. You're right. Like by the end of the night, it was packed and. I think that was like I I can't imagine Dee Dee played many more better shows than that at that kind of stage in his career. And his wife uh, was on uh, was on bass. She and Dee Dee singing too. Oh uh, yeah, and Dee Dee on guitar. Up yeah. front, Dee Dee was the front man. Um, and Marky on drums. Quite a character, uh, Dee Dee. Uh, he used to phone me after that, just out of the blue, and talk for about half an hour. You know, uh, I used to have his number at first. He was in the Catskills. And then uh, after that, he was out uh, on the West Coast. And that, and that's where he uh, sadly uh, died, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, he was a, what a character he was. Yeah, th- that was the, uh, oh my gosh. Okay, I want to get to all this stuff. But I guess I want to start off, though, the way they all start off, which is, Dan, how'd you get in a punk? What was the first time you ever came across I guess the word or the the genre or what whatever you define it as. Okay, that, you know what? This, this this will be a bit outside the box, but uh, 1969. Uh, well, Eggie made it a good year, right? So uh, a, a appropriate year. Uh, I'm walking down the street on the way to school. I come from a, a district called uh, Notre Dame de Grasse, better known as NDG in Montreal. It's the west side of the of the city, and um, I'm walking uh, on Sherbrooke Street, and uh, uh, in the window of um, Kresge's department store, a low-end department store, but they had a music section, you know, 45s and albums, uh, and uh, in the window was a um, the album, uh, The Rolling Stones, our, our greatest hits, uh, uh, Through the Past Dark, I think it was called, and they're all... It was the vile uh, uh, album cover I ever seen. They were all pressed up against the glass. Their faces distorted against glass. The hair greasy. They looked absolutely delinquent, vile, you know, insolent. And I was just, I was fascinated by it. I couldn't take my eyes off it. I wasn't sure whether it'd be appalled or, or, um, uh, or or thrilled by it, you know, um, seduced. In any case, I was seduced, yeah, by it. And um, I think if you look at that album cover now, and I mean, uh, compare with the you know the the uh, photo portfolio of the uh, Sex Pistols, and you'll see a uh, you know that that. That album cover was was uh, incredibly punk. Absolutely. In, in any case, um, I, um, I I did not come from a uh, a music family or anything. Uh, it, actually, in my home was a, a, a no music zone. Uh, we had a we had a console, a hi fi, what you might call it. But the only records in there were were Christmas records. You know, Ben Crosby or something. And so it was used once a year for Christmas, you know, maybe Boxing Day. And that's it. My father did not approve of of uh, rock and roll, least of all the Stones. And um, uh, they were vermin, in, you know, as far as he was concerned. And uh, so uh, that was um, my home environment. I was, I was, uh, I didn't have any older brothers or sisters listening to me as either. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Turning me on to it, but I had friends in that. Anyway, around the same time that I uh, saw that uh, Rolling Stones album cover in um, uh, the the department store window, uh, I decided well, I think I should get a few records of my own. 
So there was another department, another low end department store in NDG on my way to school called uh, La Salle on DeCarrie Avenue. And uh, I went on a, I went on a boosting run, uh, uh, store theft. Uh, and I, and I got my first three singles, uh, boosted, stolen out of the, uh, LaSalle department store record department. And they, those, those records were, uh, the Rolling Stones, you can't always, uh, no, uh, Honky Tonk Woman. And, uh, uh, na na hey hey, kiss kiss me goodbye or her goodbye. The the song that later became popular, but na 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 na. Oh yeah na, yeah na, yeah. Hey, hey, and hey. you know what? Great R and B song. Mm -hmm. Fabulous song. I've gone back to play it many times. You know on YouTube. And uh, the the other one was a ball of confusion by the uh, the Fifth Dimension. I think. Yeah, Fifth Dimension. Yeah. Anyway, uh, they weren't very punk those uh, those forty fives, but uh, uh, the method of acquiring them sure was. Well, and, abs uh, absolutely, but also like the Rolling Stones, like they had a bad reputation in Montreal, right? Because my mom went to that Rolling Stones show when they first played in Montreal, or the first, I guess, uh, maybe it was the first the show one, ever. The one, and, the one where they, the one where they blew up the uh, the whole PA, the, the the equipment trucks, the whole PA. And they threw the chair at the DJ who came on stage. Mick Jagger threw a chair at him or something, and there was a riot. My mom said it was like, uh, okay, was, that might have been earlier than the one, yeah, at the Montreal Forum where um, the equipment trucks were blowing up, blowing <laughs> up. I mean, this is the time, but nobody is still nobody still knows who did it. Um, you know, the FLQ was planting bombs then, you know, yeah, yeah. the Quebec separatist uh, radicals. And uh, but nobody knows it is so the stones, yeah. The stones have quite a had quite a trip in Montreal. Yeah, they definitely did. They have a bad reputation, but it's also that's the birth of American garage rock. Like there's all these bands obviously that started trying to sound like the stones, and you know, right up until the Stooges, like that that eventually becomes the, well, the they, were the, they, they were the antithesis to the Beatles. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And 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 it was uh in the same way that Malcolm McLaren um shape the sex pistols you know this svengali i think you call it yeah. um you had uh what was his name the manager of the stone andrew uh, uh yeah oldham yeah yeah andrew oldham yeah um he um saw them as uh, uh, i mean he came up with that uh uh, publicity stunt. Would would you have your uh, daughter marry one of the one of the Rolling Stones? You know. Yeah. And it completely put them at um, uh, at um, uh, in opposition of authority. You know, they were the bad boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and but the, I mean, the question comes up, and and I will get into the bad boy aspect of punk and and hardcore. Um, but does one have to be a delinquent, a, 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 a bad boy or a bad girl to, uh, qualify as punk? I don't think you are. I mean, um, you're a wild man on stage, but you, I mean, you're a, a, a very nice person. So is, uh, another band I was very close with as they were developing, uh, did a, a countless shows with them were pop. Mm -hmm. uh and um who uh, I, they were called tobango when i first uh started working with them and uh later pop but uh there's a nice bunch of kids you know mm -hmm. stefan uh, stefan uh, uh the front person the front man was um uh an incredibly sharp uh uh you know almost um uh uh, uh, precocious, you know. I mean, he, was, he was working at uh, Arts and Craft Records with an important job, but the, uh, you know, he's just twenty years old or so, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, think... Anyway, they're nice people. But where I come from, the district of NDG in Montreal, which uh, is a big part of that documentary you saw about uh, the kings of cocaine, um, delinquency was cool and um the rolling stones 
were NDG's kind of band. They look like in, in that album cover, they look like the tough guys from, you know, where I came from. And um, uh, so. Well, well, 10 years later, skip ahead. Oh, sure, go ahead. Are you, are, you, are you familiar with a band called the Discords? That's exactly who I was going to bring up to you right now. I love that band. And I was going to say, like, 10 years later, it's one of the hardest Canadian punk bands ever, the Discords that are coming out of the NDG. And, and the Discords were um, a, 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 a first wave of, of hardcore, mm-hmm. right? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Very obscure well, band, but an incredible well, band. Well, I didn't know. I never saw the Discords play. But... In grades five, six, and seven, my best friend was Bobby Henley. <laughs> and at, at the, the, and the, the name of the school uh, we went to was uh, Daniel O'Connell, DOC, which is now the conventional acronym for uh, uh, De- uh, Department of Corrections on, on all those prison shows, you see. In any case, it was an appropriate name for the school we went to, Christian Brothers, we got the strap every second day, you know, corporal punishment. Anyway, and uh, but uh, anyway, Bobby's younger brothers, Timmy and Terry, were the uh, were the were, were the discords. That's awesome. And, That's uh, wild. So I grew up with them, and I mean, I, I uh, their their uh, not theme song, but their, their their anthem was actually called NDG. You know. Cops are always chasing me and fucking NDG. And uh, I can tell you because I, I, I grew up with them and, and both our fathers, um, both our fathers uh, spent a bit too much time in bars. And uh, that's about all I'll say about that. But I, I know the circumstances they come from. Mm-hmm. And um, they were, um, they were legitimately, they came from a place that um, it, it is is you know the the, the most um, febrile punk hardcore breeding ground there is, and, and so the, the anger is legitimate, you know, the uh, delinquency is is legitimate, and uh, uh, yeah. I anyway, one of my my brother had the the forty five. And I uh, and I, got, I went home. I sent them in a Toronto time. I went home once. <laughs> went through my brother's record collection. He's he's five years younger than me. And I I said, "What's this?" He said, "The, the, the discords, uh, the forty five I had." I said, "What?" He says, "It's Timmy and Terry Hindley." <laughs> I said, "Get out of here!" I played it. And I got a real kick out of it, you know, because uh, the oh, I love the liner notes too. The liner notes said any unauthorized recording of this record is sub- subject to a severe beating. <laughs> oh yeah. That's NDG. All right. <laughs> well, they, that's amazing. They have that record. There's no cover, just that insert, you know, it's just the, the record and then the insert. Oh, like they, yeah, it was, I mean, they didn't have any money, Yeah, but they hung out. They, I mean, they were just a few, but they, they grew up slightly below Sherbrooke. I was, uh, we were a slightly above Sherbrooke. Uh, there was a park, this little triangular strip of grass and a couple of trees where uh, the discords and the NDG punk scene hung out and um, a very, very familiar territory with me and uh, for me. And uh, yeah, God bless. Uh, anyway, they, you know, they ended up in, um, I think the whole family, all the Henleys are out in Vancouver now. And uh, their their dad died. He he turned out, uh, you know, everything recovered. You know, mm-hmm. but it, it was a it was a rough youth. Yeah. What about the two twenty twos? Did you ever see that band or have any interaction with that band? No, I didn't. You know, I wasn't. Um, <clears throat> when I went back to Montreal in the, um, I left Montreal in nineteen seventy six. Okay. Uh, along with a lot of other Anglo's. Uh, probably including members of your family, uh, Anglo Montrealers who were fleeing uh, Quebec uh, due to the fact that uh, a separatist government was elected and, and a referendum for Quebec separation was forthcoming. That happened in 1980. The economy was absolutely decimated. And being an Anglo was even worse 
because um, Angles didn't get a job in the civil service. You know, they didn't become fire firemen or, you know, very few cops or, you know, let alone at, at you know, jobs at City Hall or uh, f- forget about the, you know, working for the Quebec government. No, that was that was for um, what uh, was would be referred to as pure lane, uh, pure wool, uh, 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 French, French uh, speaking, uh, French uh, Quebecers, you know. Um, and uh, so it was, uh, it was not a good place to be economically. And so there was a great exodus of, of people. And uh, I was one of them. And like I said, your family was probably uh, am- amongst that. Um, and but then there was guys like, uh, well, the Discord, the Discord stuck around. Uh, some of their pals, that was the time when Montreal had the, um, not, not per capita, had the most bank robberies per year, uh, late seventies, early eighties. And a lot of those kids were, a lot of the were young guys from NDG. Um, one of whom I remember Donald Cryer got, uh, he finally got, he got actually shot down in a police chase by, uh, and killed by the, by the cops in NDG. Uh, but th- that, that's the environment the discords came from, you know, yeah. and so truly was a, a, a um, you know, uh, a legitimate uh, springboard into hardcore punk. It's also uh, like just you bring it up there. Montreal in general is like uh, like I always try and explain this to people from America that like there's no other place that functions like the city of Montreal in terms of crime. Like there's just so many layers to organize crime and it's interesting like when we had that illegal cannabis boom where all the shops popped up in toronto and vancouver it never happened in montreal because montreal everything's kind of locked down pretty tight is that right you know what i didn't even know that but that makes complete sense also uh damien ask all the bands who've had their vans and equipment stolen in montreal from the Stooges you know. on down, right? Like Sonic Youth. I know no, Sonic Youth wasn't in Toronto. Stooges were as the, was Stooges, the Stooges. It happened too, but yeah. I, I could, I could, I mean, numerous bands yeah. I know personally, yeah, had their gear or the whole vehicle stolen in Montreal. And I mean, you got to be streetwise in that city. You yeah, know? yeah. No, you don't fuck and, around in Montreal. And uh, yeah, so you're, you're you're spot on about. Uh, about that. In any case, I was I was saying that. <laughs> so during the seventies, I first fled to Edmonton. I was in Edmonton and off and on until um, uh, seventy seven in 19, November seventy seven. I, I was terribly bored there, and uh, you know I, I had a, a, a I was working as a for the parts. Parts department of a of a recreational vehicle uh, outlet, and um, and I I, I, I got to get out of here. And I picked up um uh, I, I I was into music, and uh, I used to pick up a circus magazine. And I um I was reading circus magazine, and I, and there was a, a, a small uh, story in the back about a Toronto band called the Dios. And I was reading, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I, the guys, they sound pretty cool. I hadn't heard them yet. I, there was one radio station in Edmonton. There was no FM. There was one, I believe it was called Chet. And they were playing, it seemed like every hour, the Eagles, new kid in town. And that's what drove me out of town. <laughs> I swear to God, every hour couldn't escape that anyway so i'd read about the spend the dios in toronto i just bought a plane ticket <clears throat> quit my job and headed to toronto you know oh. I, I, I cold call <laughs> uh and um i went to see and i was looking around it said, toronto was a live music city keep in mind montreal wasn't a live music city. it was a dance club town mm. like that. very big in disco you know Mm-hmm. Stanley Street, the 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 um, the um, limelight, mm-hmm. incredible club, you know, a Studio Fifty Four type, uh, and uh, uh, but Toronto, there's a lot of live music plays, and I went to see um, uh, the. I was only nineteen years old, 
and I went uh, and I went and saw the uh, Nazi Dog and the Vile Tones. That was the name of the band, the Nazi Dog and the Vile. <laughs> yeah, it's been withdrawn since, of course. But uh, and they were playing at Young Station, and uh, I went and I was went, uh, and I lost about half a set. I really, I really actually. So, you know, I, as, as a, an older, a 60s person, you know, having grown up with Sam and Garfunkel, the Stones, and uh, just the, everything, you know, melodic, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I found in this, uh, the vile tones to be, uh, you know, 95% attitude uh, and 5% uh, uh, musical skill. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I, I didn't take to that immediately. Um, I was, I would more, but I was listening to CFNY at the time when you could get it. CFNY, which later became Edge One Two, and CFNY was a very cool radio station. It was based out of Brampton, so you often couldn't get the signal in in um, in Toronto. And I'm not sure if it'd come out yet, but uh, Teenage Head really caught my ear. Yeah, they, well, um, they they've got that more kind of melodic bend to them. Certainly, well, it's album. it's rock and it, 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 there's riffs, there's rock and roll, but they were definitely. I mean, I'm sure they qualify as punk. Oh, definitely. Oh my God, I love that band so much. Like they're Canadian Ramones. I did. Oh God, they were. Hey, you know what? I had them. I believe it was the Friday of Labor Day weekend. El Combo upstairs, two thousand, and Frankie was in top form and it was like 1980, 79, 80, all over again. What a night that was. Oh my God. And uh, yeah. And so I got to work with, so anyway, you know, while I was, I, I was, uh, anyway, in, in Toronto, I ended up going to Ryerson into uh, the journalism program. Uh, which I got into, not for my marks. I only had a grade eleven education from um, um, from Montreal. That's when high school ends in Montreal, grade eleven, and I I just started working right after that. And um, but I but I I did work in Montreal on my seventeenth birthday. I got a job as a copy boy at the Montreal Gazette, and uh, and. Uh, that's what uh, turned me on to journalism. And uh, uh, the newsroom was a very cool place. Uh, the reporters, a lot of them had long hair. and They're pretty rock and roll themselves. Uh, so uh, I got turned on. But anyway, having, having had that job experience, uh, I didn't quite have the academic experience. I got into the uh, journalism program at, at Ryerson. I worked there for a year and a half at the Montreal Gazette. And I quit when I was 18 and a half years old because I thought I was too old for the job. You know, um, was, that, was that like Nick off Demar working there at that time? Uh, Nick wasn't at the Gazette then. Nick, Nick was a city councilor, but I became Nick. Um, I became good friends with Nick. What a terrific man. And his, his, his daughter, of course, Melissa. I remember Melissa when, from when she was five years old. And he made a character because he included her in a lot of his columns. And there was even cartoons done by uh, Aislin, the Gazette, uh, Montreal Gazette um, uh, cartoonist of him, of Nick and, and uh, Melissa together, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I got, to, I, Nick was a, a mentor for me, you know? If I ever needed, you know, I was on a story, I didn't have any contacts on it, I phoned Nick. Nick, who do I call? You know, right, right off, right off the top of his head. Call it. Here's the phone number. You know, and uh, you know, I, I, I put him in, in the uh, at the bars. He often went to, and uh, just a, a splendid guy. So anyway, I'm not surprised what um, happened um, that uh, Melissa. Uh, the famous story being that she was at a show. In Montreal, she, obviously she was probably playing an instrument at the time, but she attended the uh, Smashing Pumpkins' first ever show at um, uh, Fafoon Electric, and and uh, and um, and they were kind of really treated badly by the audience. And she went up, she went backstage, and 
met with the master and said, you know, ignore what happened tonight. You, you guys are terrific, et cetera, et cetera. And became uh, great friends with Billy, you know? Yeah. Um, and then she went on, of course, to play in Hall. And, but I wasn't surprised at all that, um, that uh, Nick's daughter would become, a, you know, a, a famous in the, in, the, in the rock world. Uh, because it, yeah, Nick, there was a magic about Nick. Nick was an incredible guy. What a character! And he died very young, uh, very sad. My my dad told me he was called the uh, the mayor, the unofficial mayor of Montreal or something. Uh, they had like a uh, because he was just the guy that you know, the minister of knew. nocturnal affairs. <laughs> The Minister of Nocturnal Affairs. That's it. Sorry, that's he it. ran. He ran. He, he ran for federal office actually <laughs> in NDG, and uh, but he but he couldn't he couldn't knock out the uh, the uh, liberal incumbent <laughs> member of Parliament uh, Warren Almond. Uh, no, uh, Nick Nick didn't win that one. And, um, he was running. He was he was a conservative. Oh wow. Uh, the Progressive Conservative Party, Maroney's Party. And Nick was anything but conservative. Nick was, Nick really couldn't be pegged to any ideology. He was a radical youth, but like many radical youths uh, who became yuppies. He didn't become a yuppie, but uh, he did uh, uh, find his way closer to the center. In any case, it seemed like a, uh, he would have been Minister of Nocturnal Affairs. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Had he been elected, uh, so that's uh, Melissa's dad. Anyway, yeah. I hope she's doing well. She's a yeah. really nice girl. Super I've met nice. her. I've met her several times uh, in Toronto and talked with her uh, and and told her how much I loved her dad. She, you did. You did shows for her too. I did one. I think there was there was one show I, um, I had Melissa on. I, yeah, I can't remember. Was it at? Um, uh, tequila, it was Summer she, Dollar. I th- no, I think it was Elmo. Or maybe tequila it was, Lounge. Maybe it was Tequila Lounge. Um, yeah, it was, oh, no, oh, a, 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 a dark hall in my career, that place. Yeah. Well, but once again, you were always trying to book interesting stuff. There's- I had, no, I went on the worst losing streak in history. Uh, I moved there. That was after we were, um, uh, the, the Elmo Combo building was sold. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my partners, the, the business owners, Jim Ang and Lam Deba did not have a lease, yeah, which is very bad. It's, it's good for getting a lower rent, but it's not good when you need protection against uh, eviction. Anyway, that guy, that dance studio guy, bought the building and uh, issued us immediately with a thirty day uh, thirty day eviction notice, and we ended up getting forty five out of them, forty five days, and. Um, and, uh, you know, and I tried, I, I knew it was hopeless, but I did call some meetings and we, and we, we had Olivia Chow, uh, the, the city councilor and everything. And a lot of people trying to fight this off, you know, and stop this guy from evicting us. And because we were a really successful club at the time when I got there in, uh, at the Elmo in, in June of 1998, uh, that was my first show, a band called the Subsonics from uh, Atlanta. And uh, when we when we got there, when I got there, the it was on its last legs, the Elmo. There were no touring acts coming through or anything. And that summer, I was able to bring in band, uh, the Brian Jonestown Master I had in, um, and uh, and several several other good shows. And that that started the ball rolling. Then I started grabbing acts. Um, it, it, there was no internet, you know. You weren't you weren't messaging on, on, uh, on on Facebook or email, let alone Instagram. Yeah. It was the phone. <laughs> and one one way, one of my sources was uh, Troy Sinister of the band The Sinisters gave me uh, B Buell's phone number in New York City. Babe, of course, is the great um, uh, matriarch, I suppose you call it, of of, uh, of rock and roll, American rock and roll. Absolutely. You know, Liv Tyler's mom. Uh, yeah. You know, 
uh, and, a know, legend with, was with a lot of guys. Anyway, gave me her number. I phoned her up and uh, introduced myself, and uh, she's very nice. And I said, "Look, I'm look, trying to get a hold of um, two bands. I want to book one, the Toilet Boys, uh, Lower East Side, Alphabet City, New York punk glam, uh, just." You know that uh, they were they were the real the real deal, and uh, another one was the Upper Crust from Boston, and uh, who were uh, they were fascinating. They were they got all dressed up in Louis the Fourteenth, um, uh, you know the court of Louis the Fourteenth out outfits, yeah, uh, and uh, wigs and the they whole. They played nothing but. All the songs sounded exactly like ACDC. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was really hilarious and brilliant. And anyway, Beeb gave me the uh, phone numbers for people to contact. One was, of course, DJ Miss, uh, uh, Miss Guy, the front person of uh, of the Toilet Boys, also known as uh, DJ Miss Guy, because she was DJing too. He, he, she. Uh, and... Um, and then there's a guy in Boston, uh, the, the, uh, the leader of the Upper Crust. And um, the, I had the Upper Crust twice, I believe. But the second show, who shows up? Janine, Gar Janine Garofalo and Will Farrell, both in town. Oh, what a party that was. They were crazy. <laughs> well, could she They're crazier than me. She came to your Demon Speed show. That's that right. Did. And you know what? That was the one show. Her her um her attache called me um about a week before the show or whatever, seeing if I make sure you get her in and all. I said, Yeah, no problem. Don't you know? But it was it all was like seriously rains. I said, Yeah, terrific. And uh, uh, forgive me, but I, I didn't know who she was at the time. <laughs> but, you know, whatever, you know, and uh, and uh, I actually fell asleep and didn't get to the club until like 10 o'clock and I missed everything. Um, I later brought back Demon Speed. God, but she loved Demon Speed anyways. Yeah. Which is yeah. very cool because they were, you know, they weren't that well known. No. And you booked the swarm to open and that was a great swarm set. I remember that being a. I did. A, I, I don't even remember. I'm sorry, but uh, you know, after uh, all these years and all these head injuries and all those drugs, I often don't remember certain bands. But you were there. God bless you. <laughs> I was. I, I was at so many at the shows door collecting money. Oh, there was. Yeah, no, it was. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of us, but the swarm had a good draw. And you know, as you were saying before, hardcore kids, um, you know, are honest people, and they want to pay the band so that <laughs> see the bands they, get paid. They are. I mean, the, the you know what a community not dead yet is right now. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm close with Greg Benedetto, and I, I really, I mean, the door is open to Greg anytime uh, he he comes to me uh, for a booking. You know, at the Monarch, um, and uh, but you know, listen, I gotta say, uh, I first had Demon Speed and really liked them at Club Shanghai, my first club. Then they came into that show. And then I said, I really like those guys. So then in the fall of 1999, I called them up and I says, guys, this is the big one. This is ground zero. I was putting together a, sh a, a, a show because it, it, it was 1999 and it was all that uh, um, ridiculous fear about everything shutting down. Y2K. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I put together something called The Last Rock Show. And it was two floors at the Elma Combo. And it was um, the headline of stairs was a band I I loved and desperately wanted to book. And, uh, and I finally was in a position to get them because I offered a lot of money. $3,000. The band was Danko Jones. Yeah. <laughs> and when I went and made the pitch, their agent said, we want all, you know, for some reason I didn't have that 
I was an outsider. And they said, 100% uh, down payment on it, 3,000 bucks. And I'm like, two thirds. Okay, sure enough, 2,000. I got to get together 2,000. And I was kind of living out of pocket at that time, you know? And um, I got the $2,000 together, <coughs> went down to um, Ralph James at the agency group, said, here's your deposit. But about 15 seconds after I put that deposit down, Dango Jones' single went into rotation on Q107. I swear God was with me on that one. <laughs> In any case... What a night that was. Anyway, I, 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 this was his band, uh, um, David Speed, who I loved. And I says, guys, you've got to come up and play this show. It'll be amazing for you. You know, finally deliver him a big audience. And, and yeah, they came up and they were the opening act on that uh, on that show. I forget who the middle act was. Um, was it the Snakes or Robin Black? No, no, it was one of, um, it was one of the predecessor bands to uh, Teen Crud Combo. Oh, uh, shuttlecocks? It, it, n- uh, maybe, yeah. Uh, it was John, John, John's bad. John is uh, oh, hacksaw. God, was John's last name. Was it hacksaw? John Charant? So yeah, it was hacksaw. That's right. Yeah. Correct. God, that's God, put me on this. No, because these are all you got like, my that's... memory. I don't even know where my memory's gone. If you got it, you've got my childhood. Like these are all like key moments in me growing up these shows that i got to see in these bands like these were some of the greatest concerts i ever went to you know and there's like weird shit in the elmo combo too like that uh like the role uh well, the, what's sorry the frogs the frogs was a weird one. Oh yeah and i lost money on that one <laughs> there was a lot i lost money on but then there was acts who came in wesley willis yeah. From Chicago. Now, you know what? I have my guarantee for him that night, his first show in Toronto, was like 150 bucks. But there was good overs, you know, an 80, 20 overs for him. I ended up paying him about that. That went viral. Mm-hmm. Wesley well, Willis. In the Atlantis and Morissette I ended up paying him about 1500 I paid him the night, but it was that was a phenomenon. And the uh, God, what a what a what an interesting character. Yeah. Um he was difficult to I I I ended up getting along okay. Or I kind of stopped him in his tracks because um I don't know how we got the, the subject gone into boxing somehow or something. And I I think he was talking about Ali and I went smoking Joe Fraser. And that just, just stopped him in his tracks. And uh that was my relationship with uh Wesley, but that oh yeah oh the the we the weirdness of it all eh Vaseline Vaseline absolutely huge like Los Crudos not sorry Los Crudos uh, Limpress first show in Toronto at that Vaseline was one of the greatest hardcore shows ever in Toronto that was uh, well Monroe uh, some people might not know what Vaseline is Vaseline was a queer a queer rock uh, dance and and live night. And um, it came to me. Will Will was introduced to me by somebody else, and he wanted to book a Friday night for a, a queer rock night. And sure enough, that first night we started off at the downstairs at the uh, Elmo, and um, and it was it was uh, it was pretty crowded. Yeah, and it, about. Three or four or five shows to it. We had to we had to move them upstairs into the into the much bigger room, um, and uh, it was a uh, it, it was incredible. I mean, uh, there was a lot more queerness to Toronto than uh, than I knew. That's for sure. You know, you know he was. Uh, I just got to say about Will Monroe. I remember one time I had to. Uh, I had to uh, get in touch with him in a hurry. And I had a phone number for him. I phoned the number. And uh, it was um, he. It was him. He was, he was working at a, uh, a gay youth hotline for troubled gay youth. And, uh, and 
I'm like, wow, that's 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 really fucking noble of you, man. Uh, and I'll tell you, he never changed the he never changed the cover, the the, the door cover, five bucks of that. And I told him, you know, well, you can you can do ten, man. And he he never he never never would raise it. He just he wanted to he wanted people to come. He wanted it to be affordable. He wanted to you know just wanted something to happen. He was being a true artist, you know. He didn't care about the money, you know. So I'd I'd get him sometimes. I would I would uh, piece him off some of my bar commissions. Also, we got some uh, financing from uh, Labatt's once, and I put it right on him. And but. You know that song, uh, the one with the lyrics, Superman never made any money? Yeah. It's part, yeah, you know, and we'll know it was Superman, you know, for me. Yeah. Will Crow never made any money. It's it's fascinating. He was fucking Superman. Uh, I 100% agree. Anyway, I love that guy. You know, like they say, like all great artists aren't going to appreciate it, be appreciated while they're here. It's not until they're gone that people understand them and begin to appreciate what they did and i feel that's so true with will like now seeing exhibits for his art in the ago and he was a genius and, and he was such a community builder like what he did with vaseline is build a community that that like you're saying it didn't necessarily exist in that way prior to or didn't have a gathering point in the way that vaseline became a gathering point for for people yeah well, he, he he opened that bar, Beaver, mm -hmm. uh, bar restaurant, and that was the last time I saw him. You know, uh, and I went in there. I just thought, well, I'll go support Will's thing, and I went in there to get a meal, and um, was looking around the place. And I told him, "Hey, Will, you know what this place reminds me of?" I says, "In the late seventies, eighties, there was a place called very hip, very hip place called the Fiesta on Young Street, north of Bloor." And he went, oh, I can't believe you said that. He says, that was exactly what I was shooting at, you know? <laughs> exactly the direction I was looking at for this place, you know? And uh, and he had a <coughs> general idea uh, artwork. I guess it was a reproduction. But, uh, yeah, boy, oh, boy. Well, went too early, you know? Absolutely. I really you know but one of these people that just like you're saying rippled positivity that will be felt for generations in the city like changed like changed the city for, in, a, in a way that like groundbreak yeah. vaseline was vaseline was uh you know you think of when i first came into the when i opened up that club club shanghai back in the day gary cormier a, a, a legendary promoter fellow montrealer he came from Rosemount District. Uh, he came and I heard someone came to me later and said, Kwame loves that place. He says, the closest thing to a New York club in Toronto. And I'm like, wow. And of course, I, I had a good sense of history of, if you go to Montreal, nightlife is like the primary industry you know mm. and so you 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 get attuned to it and and nightlife is um you see it as an essential part of of culture you know and so when i um opened up that club shang i was quite sure the direction i wanted to go we had two floors was one floor was gonna be live the other floor was gonna be dan dance and i was you know Leaning, going more urban. Um, and uh, we did some stuff in that respect. But um, a lot of cool hip hop stuff happened. My whole idea, what my whole idea when all my, what you want, this is the, the, the target. You want a club that will be synonymous with an era, like Studio 54, like CBGBs, or in Montreal, Limelight, great dance club, you know? Uh, and uh, you, you, that's what you that's what you're aiming for and um so for me i i was only I, that ended after a year for me that club of shanghai but for me will monroe's uh night his his club night his monthly club night uh vaseline that was synonymous with an era you know 
by the way, I got a call from Procter and Gambler, whoever it was. And, um, and, uh, they, they jumped up like a big law, Bay street law office from, uh, you know, uh, Toronto and, uh, jump on me at the Elma Carmel, phone me up and say, Vaseline, this is a trademark infringement and they issued papers and everything. So I had to went, to Will, you know, I says, geez, well, we got to change the spelling. Hey, I had Bow Wow Wow at, uh, I'm just looking at some notes I put up. I had Bow Wow Wow at uh, Club Shanghai. Oh. <laughs> it was great, too. And they told me when, when they said it's, it's uh, um, Anna, was her name? Yeah. The, the front woman? Yeah. Uh, and um, and she was the face of Anna, obviously, the superstar. And they said it's the same bass part. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, so what, the bass part? Boy, night of show. Was that bass player ever good? And that was the end of my so what is the bass player. Yeah, bass players can be really something. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I'm I'm pretty pedestrian when it comes to music. I'm not a, you know, I I I don't know how to read a note. No, I don't know how to play an instrument. Same here. <laughs> same. That's my uh that's my uh, Yeah, I know, I've done what you've done. Yes. I've seen you do it. Yeah, I've done what you've done. I because I had to experience what it was like. And, uh, you know, the, and, and that experience is one time we were, it was, it was always covers what I, what I do. Uh, one time I wrote a song of my own and recorded it with some guys, but, uh, covers anyway, I had to do a rehearsal with these guys and, um, we were, it was season Mary chain, a uh, couple of songs and, uh, there was no rehearsal space for us. So I took them, I had a show, at the Silver Dollar and downstairs to the comfort zone wasn't being used. So I brought him into the comfort zone. We had an amp. There was no vocal mic, though. There was no, uh, no, it was just a couple of amps. And so I got a broomstick. And I said, so, so I'll, I told him, I'll just go through the motions. And when they kicked in on the song, fuck the motions. I was all in on it. And that was a, such a revelation to me about the magic of rock, how it how it is transporting um, and and transports the players when when it's all together. And also, I realized I haven't felt like this since playing organized team sports as a kid. Mm. It's 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 the um, the group. The, the shared achievement of it, you know? Yeah. And um, I, I felt like, you know what? When the band is on and you're on it, I've never surfed. I think it's like you're catching a wave and you're riding that curl, you know? And, whoa, what a feeling it is. And and I, um, I got a, a glimpse of that once. I had a band called the Chrome Cranks. At and what a band! Incredible band. And Peter what was the friend name's name. Friend man's name was Peter, and um, uh, he, I saw him very early in the show. His eyes rolled back into his head, and he reached up and he started. I reached up and started grabbing at the ceiling, like it's like doing weird, you know, like possessed shit. And anyway, I love that set. And well, I went up to him after I said, hey, hey, Pete, that was really great, man. How was it for you? And he says, I can't remember most of it. So it was probably pretty good. <laughs> there you go, man. The magic of uh, rock and roll, rock, punk rock. I mean, whatever it is, that isn't it something. Eh? Yeah. It's something. It's a mystery. Eh? Yeah. Well, like one of the legendary Shanghai shows is a band with no bass player, right? The first White Stripe show ever in Toronto. Was that opening for Question Mark the first time they played? No, 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 no. It could have put the whole audience home in the same cab for that show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, here's what happened. I was, what I was, was uh, I was a part owner of that club, Shanghai at the time. So I'm, I'm trying to find people. I don't know the ropes. I don't know anybody. I started knowing people in a hurry because I was formerly being a journalist. 
picking up the phone and calling somebody is no problem for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And saying, hey, you want to play this car or whatever. But anyways, I, I didn't know that many people. I was starting to build my my repertoire of contacts. And um, I we opened in July 97. And uh, probably in August or it had to be in August, I guess. A guy named um, Bernie, Bernie Pleskish. He's in bank called Satan's Arts Enemy God. Came, phoned me, and uh, or left a voicemail, a lot of voicemail in those days, and said he wanted to do something called Rocktoberfest. And he says, a, a one weekend night, every uh, week of October, we're going to bring up a band from Detroit and uh, and have a, 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 a Toronto act accompany them. And... Um, I said, yeah, sure. Sounds cool. Because, and the reason that, that, was, that I was all in immediately on that was because the first month we were open, and it was no, would it, July, would have been the end of July or August of 1997, um, a band called The Wild Bunch from Detroit came up. And they blew me away. They were a rock they were a rock and roll garage band. Uh, I was working also with John Bunch, uh, Johnny Dovercourt, late, later created Waveling. He was bringing in, they were bringing in acts too, him and his crew. But they were more indie rock, which I didn't like too much. I says, what's with these people? They're wearing the same clothes they wore all day when they get on stage, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know? <laughs> that's, that's where I was at back in. Anyways, but this band, the Wild Bunch, I like them. So as soon as I had Detroit, I says, you got it. <laughs> Bring Detroit on. And, you know, and, and as it turned out, there was a real, quite a scene happening down there in Detroit. Yeah. And of course, the Wild West were one of the Wild West later became the Electric Six, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, anyway, uh, fantastic so single. Night. That first single they have uh, is unbelievable. That that Wild Bunch single, that first one, the yeah, yeah. four song EP, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Oh. What a band they were alive. Oh, yeah. And in any case, so Wild Bunch were one of the four bands who were going to play this Rocktoberfest. So we're Bantam Rooster. Uh, and um, I forget, we're Gorgor Girls. Uh, in any case, we, we had this thing, Rocktoberfest. And the White Stripes were, you know, the Detroit headliner, one of the night, the Detroit, Detroit guest. The opening band, believe it or not, was... Um, Teenage Hooker? Wait. Uh, oh, High School Hooker. That's it. What a name. Holy High God. School Hooker. <laughs> and, you know, the next time I saw Jack White, um, Elliot Lefko, the great promoter, uh, I was House of Blues at the time, had the White Stripes at, um, at uh, uh, the Cool House. Uh, but big huge 2000 venue and he made me co-promoter he acknowledged uh, me and i wasn't even quite <coughs> the promoter of that rocktoberfest but uh, i was given credit for it i haven't been getting credit for some other stuff so i'll take it you know <laughs> yeah. uh it, it, yeah it sort of evens out at the end of the day uh and he made me uh co-pro of uh that you know and i got a cut of the money and stuff which, I don't know, 500 bucks. That was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the best thing about, but I went up to, in the in the dressing room after, uh, I uh, introduced myself to Jack and Meg. And um, the first thing he said to me was, how are the high school hookers doing? I said, oh, man, I can't believe you remember. <laughs> high school hookers were a band that originated from Hamilton. <laughs> and uh, Jelly was... Uh, and uh, he was a he was a character, but he was he was a hell of a rock and roller. But he had um, just as I did, uh, he had um, uh, what would you call him? substance mm. abuse troubles, mm. which he later recovered from, as I have. And um, and uh, anyway, Jack White, I couldn't remember the mem I couldn't believe the memory he had. 
Yeah. And he seems to have, he seems to be pretty good at the Beatles, uh, the, the, the Beatles test too, right? He's, he is definitely, uh, you know, like you, that's like, you'd hope that if you get that level of stardom and that level of money that you would do as much cool shit as he does with it. Like, it's just like, oh, he does rad reissues. He does this cool music magazine. It's just like, yeah. And I met him one time and that guy is uh, like, I don't know if he was ripped back then, but oh my God, he's jacked to hell. Well, he sure be, he sure he sure nailed the guy from uh, Von Bondi. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, he hit that kid hard. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You wouldn't want to. I guess you wouldn't want to mess with Jack. He was a big guy. You know the you know Americans are kind of bigger than us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, he he's probably is the meaty kind of uh, six foot uh, six one six two American. Yeah, you know? yeah, that beefy college athletic looking type. That oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> just happens you to know? play really well at rock and roll as well as probably he, sports. He's, I mean, I mean, Jack's Godfather. A lot of people, you know, he uh, brought um, a band I'm working with closely now called uh, they're um, a rockabilly band, surf rock, uh, called Itchy Bones, hmm. and um, part uh, uh, they're a trio. Uh, two of the members are Japanese, uh, okay, and. Uh, and uh, Jack had them uh, play two of his shows down in the uh, uh, southwestern U.S. on his uh, last tour last fall, and uh, and then to be doing really, I got him uh, at, at the Horseshoe in May, coming up. I got to announce that show soon uh, with uh, Dave Monks. Dave Monks of Tokyo Police Club has got a new band called Max, and they're terrific. So I'm kind of excited about that show. I don't get excited that well, I'm not. That many shows excite me anymore. I probably shouldn't say that as a promoter, but 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 I still got I still got it in me to get uh, to get revved up about a show. Well, Cone was just on uh, from Sum Forty One, and we were talking about their early shows at the Alma Combo, and Sum Forty One's like that was like kind of their launching pad was playing you know opening for Ten Foot Pole at the Elmo or playing different shows there. I put them on that show. Yeah. That was an Elliot Lefko show. I put them on that show. I put them on a North by Northeast show. Uh, back then, North by Northeast used to dump clubs. They just put together rosters and dumped them on clubs. And I noticed that a lot of bands were coming in. And uh, uh, the one year I wasn't involved, I was Booker at Elmo Combo. But I saw they're putting in these fucking shows. These poor kids are coming from, you know, hundreds and thousands of miles away. And they're playing to nobody yeah. because the show wasn't put together properly. And the following year, I says, "Yeah, I'll work with you, but I got a vi- I got a veto on these shows, and I'm I'm putting in some of my own acts." And that t- uh, uh, Teen Club Combo was an act I put on, uh, I believe, and uh, some forty one, and there was a, n- a number of acts. You know what I mean? You need some lo- you need some local meat here, uh, to and th- these type of bands weren't applying to. Uh, to North and Northeast because they saw for what it was a big fucking battle of bands, you know, well, that, an adult battle of bands. Well, that, that, uh, Tinker combo show is one of my favorite shows ever like that. It's such a, that was like one of the greatest Tinker combo shows, Nick coming out, throwing flowers to the crowd. And then we all, yeah, yeah. we went all over to Mary Margaret O'Hara's house for a party afterwards. Do you remember that? Is that did I go? Yeah, you were there. It was like you. Yeah, because I was kind of, I was kind of, uh, I was kind of close. I was kind of close to Mary Margaret for a while, did, and we went to us. I took the bell race there once. <laughs> yeah, uh, the bell race from LA crashed over at Mary Margaret, uh, Mary Margaret's house. You know? Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, Mary Margaret, another great character. Another great, you know. Oh, it was a crazy what night. I'm, it was like you, me, Dave Foley, uh, Dave Doman from Swearing at Motorist was there. Uh, obviously, Nick, Allison, Esther. It was like a, a real. F- oh, wow. <laughs> it was a fun time. Mary Margaret, eh? Yeah, it was fun. It Mary Margaret O'Hara's house, just like a oh, Canadian music legend. And she just opened her house to this yeah. after party from the Teen Crow Combo show. Oh, jeez, eh? But I guess that's oh, through you. <laughs> it's, 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 it's faintly coming back to me. <clears throat> like I said, I've, I've lost a lot of my memory. Now I know he's got it. You got it. <laughs> Well, I think that's the thing is like, for me, these were like things that were happening like once in a while, 
you know, like this would be like something like, you know, these are pivotal moments for me, but you're doing this every night, you know, like there's music coming through every night and there's just well, there's so many legends. Like, like one thing that came up on the show, Max, when he was on from the Deadly Snake said the story about how you came into working with Club Shanghai. And I want to hear your kind of version of that uh, event. How did that all come to be? Well, that came to be okay. I was um, in 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 uh, cold snowstorm um, in nineteen ninety five. I was a journalist. I was working at the Fifth Estate, CBC. Great job. I was actually an associate producer at that time. But I struggled with drugs. My drug of choice being free based cocaine, aka crack. Uh, and, uh, anyway, I just left work one day in 95 and never went back. I think I was, it was probably a notepad on the desk left in mid sentence of an interview. And that was the end of me there. I just, yeah. And they tried to get me back and all. And I, I said, no, no, man, I'm gone. And, uh, so I'd become a 24 seven crackhead, you know, based in Regent Park, uh, and uh, and anyway, uh, I went through that for about a, a year. I went out west to try to uh, shape up. Worked as a, as a crab fishing boat. And, uh, anyway, I never come back to uh, Toronto. And um, a friend of mine somehow, somehow knew these people, this couple, who owned two buildings on, um, on Spadina. And... Um, and one of them had a, a sort of a, a hall on the third floor and, and, a, and a pool hall on the next floor. And they were having trouble with the uh, Chinatown gangsters. Um, at, the, at that time, there would have been still some um, uh, Vietnamese street gangs. And they were having trouble. So they, they heard a, a friend of theirs, uh, uh, another um, Asian, Toronto Asian business person uh, had a had owned a club called um, uh, the Lions Den up on college and they were putting in bands and it was doing really well so they wanted to put in bands they wanted and I and my only credentials was that I was uh, Occidental a guy low you know I'm, I'm a white guy who speaks English and might know some you know so that's my world well, it wasn't quite my world uh, but I just yeah, coming from Montreal, nightclub, eh? Yeah, let's create a nightclub. I says, it's going to be a little more to it than that. Oh, then get into the, the PAs, even that sign. I created the name Shanghai. Anyway, uh, we ended up opening up a club. I, I got sober for three months, clean sober. And um, for three months, we put that together. And a lot of design was my own and stuff was just, uh, just passed together. Ended up looking pretty good, though. It was a pretty interesting looking place. Oh, God, yeah. It was like, uh, it was amazing because there was the two floors. And, yeah. And, and the elevator. Yeah, and you ne you hope the elevator never opened on one of the other floors because you never knew what was going to be happening when that elevator <laughs> opened up. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Is that Dante's Inferno or something? I guess so. It was uh, like it was like it never opened. What level? <laughs> yeah, because well, 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 it was like, was it four? Fourth floor had the big room, and the, four, the, the no, the, the third floor was the big one. Okay, and where we did uh, blow up uh, uh, for a while, where Bow Wow Wow played, where um, uh, sick of it all. Yes, that and when people trash the ceiling, pulling down the ceiling. Jesus, that's a story I wanted. I, I wanted to touch on yeah um that huge that's the birth of toronto hardcore my era that show we talk about it all the time on this show are you kidding oh god yeah that was a huge moment for like i was going to shows before that but in terms yeah of, yeah in terms of who was coming out to that show and who i met in the pit that day oh yeah yeah oh the crowd oh yeah, yeah absolutely but, no, no, but the hardcore had already started oh absolutely here, my, i mean yeah. my era my era in particular oh, okay yeah 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 because you were just a kid and it was all age show. yeah um uh, anyway, the, the the club and and the and the fourth floor was was the live room. Yeah. Um, so that's where uh, it's the White Stripes, Nico Case, um, 
Brian Jonestown Massacre, uh, and um, my band St- Demon Speed. Our our boys Demon Speed. My band Starting Block. Bro, really? Yeah, we played there with Reset, who would go on to become Simple Plan, and DBS, who okay. never showed up. Is that right? Eh? Yeah, that night. It was such an important venue. Like you said, there's you wanted to make a venue that's tied to an era. That, to me, is 100% tied to an era, and it's tied to an era of pre-Canadian music being taken seriously internationally. So you have... Lo- we, lost, we only lasted one year. Yeah, but it's and that's a because, huge year. You know, huge year. Yeah, that... You know, I went to Henry. Um, what was it about Shirley? Shirley and Henry, and we were the building owners. Uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Chinese. Uh, and um, I went to Henry once and said, Henry, we got to have inventory on the bar or else, you know, people can steal. And he says, ah, oh, inventory, it's, 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 a, it's a waste of time. And I told him, Henry, what are you talking about? I says, I'm going to go to all of corporate America and tell them, inventory, you're making a big mistake. It's a total waste of time. <laughs> anyway, I mean, it was just doomed financially because there was going to be no inventory. <laughs> I mean, you got to take inventory in the business, you know? I'm sure you, I'm sure you do on your t-shirts and your 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 your, your term words, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> um, in in any case, um, so yeah, there's two fours of the club and uh, oh, another show that's who else? Uh, who that? Oh God, who else played? There? Oh no, here's a legend. Uh, anyway. Here's a legendary one in that room for you. Yeah, yeah. Promise Ring and Grade double booked with Stigmata and Blood for Blood. So Stigmata and Blood for Blood had to go on at three thirty in the afternoon. Uh, to, to like no one, and then Promise Ring and Great. All three bands, all four bands, sorry, are now legendary bands. But yeah, yeah. neither. Well, I guess Promise Ring had a really good turnout that night, but Poor Stigmata and Blood for Blood definitely had no one show up. That was the night he. Um, I was down. I was downstairs in the third floor of my office, uh, smoking, um, smoking rock. And uh, and I had a a, a girl of similar um, uh, my ilk with me, and uh, and it spread, but uh, was totally appalled by it. Yeah, <laughs> totally appalled. And it was a time and I, and when I heard this later. I says, "What the hell? God forbid that I bring drugs and sex into into you know uh, into the good name of rock and roll." <laughs> well here's here's another wrinkle to that story i was the one i came down first because you wanted me to come down and get a cd to play on mods and rockers and walked in on it and was like oh my god and went back upstairs <laughs> i guess as a kid you were i guess was, i was shocked i was, I was a little tough for you as a kid it was a very eye-opening okay. experience for me as a young person <laughs> well yeah um i guess and i know you're you've you've never you've never gone uh sideways with that kind of stuff uh well, uh, and um oh well you know no what judgment no is, judgment absolutely and I, even then there it, was no it, judgment. it was what it was but i'll tell you what i'm uh i don't recommend it i don't i don't i don't, don't recommend that lifestyle a lot of pain um one uh i i did want to bring up that you brought off of the top but the infamous jay Riotard show which was the yeah um yeah which is also Jay was at uh well Jay had his struggles, obviously, as we all know, and 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 ultimately oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. It, it cost him his life. But I think that for Jay was at a point where he was temporarily sober and I think was at running really hot. And that show, I think in retrospect, is is one of those shows that if it it would have been one of the greatest shows of all time, <laughs> if it had gone one way. We'd all look back upon it as being like one of the greatest shows ever in Toronto, but now it's one of the most. It's still one of the greatest shows ever. It's just one of the most infamous shows ever. Uh, the greatest show, the greatest Jay Retard show ever, because I, I was doing all. I was doing Lost Sounds. Yeah, I did two Lost Sounds shows, and two, maybe three, uh, Jay Retard shows before Collective Concerts came in. 
And and that night was a collective conscious night. I I was just a house booker, but I developed a big relationship with Jay. You know, I got you know done a lot of shows with him. But the 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 second Law of Sound show, which was their finale uh, tour, that was a that was the most amazing ever. Uh, um, what's her name from Metric? The front the front woman uh, Emily Haynes. Emily Emily was at the show. And um, it was one of those nights. They were so good out on the patio after Emily um, introduced herself to me, said, I'm with a band called Metric. I said, oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, she said, I'd really like to play here. I said, OK, and I've got a phone number and we tried to. We never pulled together. But uh, so she had a great time that night. You know, as a promoter, sometimes you can't control stuff, but... Um, well, and Jay was uh, real. Like, that's the thing about people... Like, a lot of people in music, it's an act, right? Like, we go back to the Rolling Stones, we are talking about, like, that. that's that's a put-on in a lot of ways, the character that they're doing up there. With Jay, well, it was real. Like, it was never... And it was always scary in a, in a way, or dangerous in a way. Well, you know what happened? Is I was in... I was high. I was drinking and doing drugs. And, um, but I, I was a functioning alcohol drug, obviously. Mm-hmm. I couldn't have done all these shows without it. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I heard a, a ruckus. I was in the kitchen, I think, the, the back room. And uh, I came out and Jay's leaving the stage. So I thought, well, me having the longest relationship with him, I, I can talk him out of this. So I went up on a stage. I said, J, 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 what, what's the problem? What's the problem? You know, as soon as I start talking to him, some kid from the fucking floor spits on us. So I left off the stage and started swinging. By the time I get back, <laughs> Jay's gone. And I felt really abandoned. Not to, not to be therapeutic about that. But yeah, I did feel you motherfucker. I just left off the guy who spit on us. And you fucking off? And that's when I got on the mic and started saying, fuck JV. I wanted the CBC gang to play again, of course. It wasn't feasible. Uh, but uh, and then I said, mentioned something. Poor Craig, I mentioned something about fuck, give, give the people all their money back. And uh, that that wasn't good for Craig. And Craig and I were were close, you know. And I really, I, you know, that's one of the many, uh, just a, a small snapshot of regrets I have. I would not have behaved that way. You know, these days, I'm like, I bring a couple of magazines for me to do the door of my shows, you know, to, while people aren't coming in to read. And I'm business-like. I got receipt, you know, man, in those days, I could have done a much better job had I uh, not been I. But you know what? It wouldn't have been as much fun <laughs> at the time. I, I think that I think it's I think that's sadly, uh, you know, like, and I don't mean to make light of what you went through at all in any sort of way because these things have become kind of like legends, and these are moments that are like maybe not great memories for you, and they become things that people kind of story like like the, you know and i don't want to bring up a painful one but the john dwyer uh incident oh well, yeah i'll bring that up because that's like th- these are well these are like moments that have become hey, that, legendary but they're like sorry go on that's a combo of, of that's a combo of the functioning alcoholic i got a show with these guys uh and i booked them except i don't really i didn't really like the music but they were on uh Larry's label in the red. Mm-hmm. And um, and uh, so I booked him. I'm good enough to do a show with him. I don't have a small guarantee and whatnot and put on a show. And um, the day of the show, or uh, advances to uh, well after load in, they haven't shown up. And I got no means. I can't get a hold of them. And I'm like, are they coming or what? When should I open doors? Da, 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 da. You know, when do I get the show started? Uh, and I phoned, I got on the phone and phoned the Detroit venue. They played the night before. Yeah. To see if they played. Guy picks up the phone. 
I says, hey, uh, sorry to bother you. I'm calling from uh, Toronto. I got a band called The Hospitals tonight. They played at uh, a year club last night. And the guy, before I didn't finish the sentence, said, showed up late and didn't even phone. I went, okay, got it. So I piped the phone and I waited. Anyway, so I got there late, no sounds, no nothing. And I start the show. And I, you know, there might have been three opening acts in those days. You know, we started a bit late, I guess. But one of them was the uh, main support act was a band called the Vulcan Dub Squad, who played on stage with executioner's hoods over their heads, okay? And um, anyway, they're up uh, on stage playing their set uh, towards the end of it. I'm at the bar with Sean Dean of the Sadies. And I noticed the, the hospital setting up their gear at the end of the room. I thought, oh, it's great. They're, they're getting all set up so they can get right to the stage, you know? And I don't know how they got the vocal mic going, but all of a sudden they started playing while the band on stage was still playing. So I'm glancing back and forth and on stage, despite the fact that they got executioner's hoods on their faces, I can see the blood draining from their, from their skulls, you know, of the, the horror, the embarrassment, the humiliation, you know? And uh, I looked back at the side and I, I looked over at Sean. I had a shot. I downed the shot. I said, Sean, these motherfuckers think they're bad. They picked the wrong town. So I walked over. And what I did, it's in the video. I grabbed the vocal mic, right? Mm -hmm. And that drummer got up. He had the vocal mic, the drummer. He got up and uh, shoved me pretty hard. That was it. Gloves are off. So I smoked in pretty good. I got about eight shots or so. Lefts and rights. I was quite proud of myself. Jabs and hooks. Uh, and, uh, and somebody broke up the fight. And, and then uh, and then I was still, you know, when you get in a fight, I, I don't think you're a fighting guy. You're, you, I've been in a few, you're but I know, yeah. I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm sort of but what happens is the adrenaline starts going. Yeah. And I was, anyway, I, I picked up the snare drum from the uh, cat and just winged it at the, and it was in the direction of the bar, you know, down at, not high, but down at about knee level. And it hit uh, one of Dwyer's guitars and, uh, or his guitar. And, uh, and uh, well, you know, next thing I know, or I didn't see it coming, I got smashed right in the back of the head by that guitar. And I tell you, you know, they say you, you see stars, you know, when you get hit and you see stars. I saw a supernova on that one. Yeah, I can imagine. And then I felt the shots coming in the back of my head. And I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself around, you know. I was knocked out on my feet, if you say, but I was had an awareness that I was catching shots in the back of the head. Anyway, so it somehow got broken up. I ended up in the washroom and uh, um, uh, what's her name? D uh, Dina? Deanna? From uh, from Tinker Combo? Oh, Allison Baker? No, uh, not Allison Baker, the other girl. Oh, Jamie Towns? No, there was, she's another. Oh, was she in Teen Crow? Anyway, she came in and said, Dan, that was wrong. And she was she was a she was a hardcore girl. Yeah, and she was very nice. I mean, Sean Dean came in, of course. And uh, anyway, you know what? I just went, I went around the corner to I said, well, I'll just let them play the show. And uh, I went around the corner to um, Oasis. There was a bar called Oasis around the corner. Went there, had a few drinks, and then look, you know, looking at my watch and saying, well, it shows or I better get back and settle them. And I felt it'll be like a hockey game, you know. Like, hey, wow, crazy. Hey, we got enough scraps. Sorry about that. Or, you know, you know, shake hands kind of thing. And so when I turned the corner up Spadina, uh, they were loading out outside. And there was a sort of, I remember, I sort of a horseshoe of people around them as they're loading out. And I walk up and, uh, and like I said, I was ready to shake hands. And uh, Dwyer saw me, looked at me and he says, motherfucker, you owe us money. I looked at him. I reached into my pocket, pulled out a water bills, put it back to him in my pocket and said, yeah, 
Take it off me. And stood there. And he didn't do a fucking thing. So, yeah, I kind of like that. That guy's. Um, I guess, listen, I don't hate anybody. It's, hate, hate's not a good thing to carry around. Um, but I did. No, I don't like John Dwyer. I think there's an understandable. And, but beat. later and later he auctioned <clears throat> that that guitar for a charity. And um, Greg Benedetto came to me. It was great. No, John Shouten of Teen Anger came to me and he was involved in it somehow and uh, said, Dan, would it be okay with you? It was nice of him to check if we, if we auction the guitar that you got almost decapitated with. Uh, and, and I said, you know, that's for a charity. I'll, yeah, I'll go along with it. But I was really, you know what? Uh, I, I was What really pissed me off was uh, I, I read some John Dwyer wrote about it and he, and he said something like, I, I don't need this guitar anymore. It's just like, and it was kind of like, well, yeah, you're just dumping it then. You're not, it's not a donation to some charitable uh, cause. You're just like, I don't need it anymore. Here, take it, you know? Well, it's so a bad attitude, you know? So uh, that guy ever wants to drop the gloves again, I'm on. Uh, I'm on. I, I hope there's, I hope there's a peaceful... Um, re, uh, reconnection at some point. I hope that, that finally that hockey post fight hockey handshake can happen because it's well, I don't think he was, I, I don't think he's capable of it. He, I think now he probably would be. I think at the time, like you're saying, the adrenaline firing off, you know, like I think it, yeah, it, it, a, lot, a lot of adrenaline involved. I, yeah, I, I do also, uh, it's you know not once again to make light of it or to to turn it into something more than it it was or or something that different than it was, but here's this guitar now becoming one of the most infamous guitars in this genre of music, you know, and a genre that you help build in Toronto, like the Deadly Snakes, like uh, Death from Above, like th these were bands that you were the champion of, Teen Crunch Combo, the greatest Toronto band ever. Yeah, oh yeah, they're your faves. Yeah. I, I would say if I'm like, I would say them, the Swarm, are the bands for me that were like pivotal as a young person. Is that right? Eh? Oh God, yeah. Like Nick, That's cool. you know Nick, and now Nick's obviously well. Nick's been a friend forever, but like, I think he was just as a young person up there. He's like the he was such an incredible front person. And obviously Allison on guitar, Jamie, Mark, and then Bubby on drums. Like it was always good. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, they were part of my, uh, those are people I was close to, you know, I, I still see Nick mm -hmm. and, um, and Allison was terrific. Um, the comedy battle between you and Nick. Those were people I cared about. I, I did have, I was, you know, about, I came into this as an outsider. I, I've always been an outsider, you know, as far as the industry is concerned um and uh and i i can't blame anybody for that i was you know i was a, a, a bull in a china shop you know uh often but uh but there was over over the years yeah geez i've uh, got to meet some uh terrific people people i really liked you know uh, detroit detroit was a, detroit were great guys i, I like detroit well, yeah, like, and you, you know, the Zoo Bombs, like the bands from Japan, bands from, oh, yeah. you know, like the, these bands that you were like championing, building up in this city, like you put on these bands. And as you're saying, like, <laughs> there might not be enough people to fill a, fill a taxi cab home after the show, but some of these bands have gone on and become legendary. Yeah. Huge bands. Um, oh, boy. I got to ask you, uh, there are two legends that I, I heard about. And once again, if you don't want to talk about this stuff, we don't have to, but they, okay. you died twice, one time outside of a Jimi Hendrix tribute night at the Elma combo. And another time that, I mean, when your, your heart stopped on the table, uh, my heart stopped on the table where I heard you got uh, attacked outside of a Jimi Hendrix night. Oh yeah. 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 And that you, um, you know, I mean, you know what happened that night? I was doing the door. It was a spectacular night. It was a Tuesday, a, a bonanza. A, it was packed. And um, my girlfriend at the time was at the bar. And I went over to 
stand with her. There was a guy beside her, and I tapped him on the shoulder and asked him to move. He looked at me and then turned, just turned right back around. And I just pulled him around and fucking smoked him three times. Kind of drove it like a cartoon, drove him out the door with punches, which was a very NDG, which is a very, you know, delinquent NDG thing of me to do. It just, But, I, I, you know, I was drunk. And I don't know what happened after. I don't remember. Was I dead? That's what I, I remember I, hearing. I, I, I had a fractured skull. Yeah. But I, when I woke up in the hospital, a day I was in a coma for a couple of days. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, when I woke up, I just, I ripped all the tubes out. I said, I want to go home. Which wasn't a great idea. Now we we know about concussion protocol yeah. and all that. Especially going back to concerts after that. Yeah. What was the other time? Uh, I I heard it was you going to England. You don't have to talk. Yeah. About it. Well, you know what? That was the that was the night I I I double booked. What's that trip? I left on that trip, and um. Anyway, I was in Manchester for a week and uh, totally immersed in the drug world. The districts of uh, Hume and Moss Side um, was for quite notorious. And uh, yeah, I was with a uh, uh, cab driver, she was. Nice girl, and we got along terrific and uh but we were doing drugs and heroin was her uh, was her drug of choice mine was rock and uh anyway we were doing both and she hit me with a shot and it was like oh i i just stood up right up again it's just wow that's a big one and uh, next thing i know i'm on a i'm on a stretcher going out <laughs> in the elevator i don't know how she was able to get the uh, ambulance down and whether I, whether I don't know what they're doing. My chest was kind of sore afterwards, so they'd probably give me a few shots in the chest, if not the, uh, if not the pulp fiction needle. Yeah, you know that's that's a, that's a- uh, because I was kind of bruised in my uh, middle of my chest. Um, so I don't know. Anyway, I mean. You you told me that about Keith this. Richards, you know, I'm kind of lucky and. Uh, well, you're a survivor. You know, you're a survivor. Like even for- yeah, Andy- there's been other. I've had. I've had guns to my head too and stuff like that. But uh Well, that's amazing. You know that uh, that um catching the curl of the wave, mm-hmm. surfing as I what I mentioned earlier. Yes. Well, not only has that worked for you, that's worked for you to see the world. Oh, absolutely. You've got this 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 um um uh, art you do has uh given you a surfboard to you know surf the world yeah oh, and it, what, a, and what a beautiful it, thing eh? and it starts at club shanghai it starts pl- opening for breakdown at club shanghai with my band starting block ah, you would have you would have found somewhere else i appreciate that but <laughs> You would have found somewhere else to play. Well, you had it in you. Well, that we, but there was all every, everywhere else was a battle of the bands, you know, and like you know, even the opera house. Like you could play the opera house, but you pay like you'd have to sell twenty five tickets to your friends to get some terrible slot. You took chances. Yeah, yeah. You took chances on bands. Like you would be like, ah, come down. What do you do? I remember you calling my house all the time, being like, "Hey, Damien, who's good for this show? Who should I get for this show?" Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you were one of my early contacts. Yeah, wow. Yeah, back in Mods and Rockers days, and and Jeez. it's you know I can't even I, I damn those phone books are long gone and <laughs> oh god I I still have actually I don't know if I still have it but somewhere I had the Bionic tape that you taped me for because they were coming to play at Shanghai and you're like I got I'll give you a tape of bionic that i'll uh, that they just sent me and you can play it on mods and rockers and, and i went yeah. down and picked it up to play it on mods and rockers and stuff oh, right bluebird like, i remember so many bands so many bands that people talk about now that that have followings and have an audience like they were just like tricky woo tricky, tricky woo, woo. Trick, the, uh, boy i like them space shits 
the spaceship show at the Shanghai is, I watched the video the other day. What, a, like an unbelievable performance. Yeah, they were brought to me by the Deadly Snakes. <clears throat> Deadly Snakes, so they only, they, they only, Deadly Snakes were um, dismissive about just about everyone and everything. Mm. But they, they looked up to the spaceships. Yeah, yeah. The spaceships were, you know, like like Teen Crit Combo, like one of these bands that if you got to experience it, you're blessed because not a lot of people were there in these rooms, but everyone that was will tell talk talks about the power to this day. I've seen thousands of well, bands. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure there's stuff happening today that the, the, the younger kids now are. Oh, absolutely. Are, you're going to remember the same way we remember stuff, you know, dude, you're still doing these shows, you know, like you're still oh, doing it for uh, the next generation of kids, you know, like that's the, yeah. the, the reality is like, <laughs> you're the constant, right? Like that's the well, thing. I've got my thing every year. It's, it's a nice template. It's uh, called the class of, and whatever the year is class of, you know, and I've had some um, incredible acts on that. Um, uh, Orville pack, mm -hmm. uh, uh Alita Pimiento, mm -hmm. uh Dilly Dally, um who are just uh, anyway, this some incredible uh bands have gone into incredible things. But it's a way of uh is you know what? Promoter, bring something to the fucking table. So yeah, create something, you know, like so I create that uh that um this this annual uh, showcasing of uh, young bands. Uh, back in the day, you know, I created the, the triple header at festivals. One band, three nights, same club. And Harris of Space Shits, his band was one of the first I did that with at uh, club at uh, the Silver Dollar, uh, King Con and the Shrines. Um, then I got I got uh, North by Northeast to fly them over. You know, yeah. No fun of these was doing what I told them to do then, because I've gone against them for two years. Uh, 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 non NXNE shows, and I called them uh, NEXT or something like that. Yeah, it was the and, remember the uh, counter program. But I was putting it and um, and uh, uh, Death from Above. Yeah, was one of them. Uh, Wolf Parade was another one of them. And uh, so Michael Hall at the boss of NXNE threw in the towel for 2006, just work with us. I says, okay, but you got to do it my way. So part of it was uh, King Kong and his shrines, uh, triple header, silver dollar. The triple header was, uh, a, a, you got to be a booker to know how to do that because you needed to have, you, as a booker, I knew that in festivals that if a band played one night, and ignited a buzz, you could circle around, and new people who were attending the festival would come the following night. And if the band's really, really good, the same people might come for another show. So you could do three nights, but that band would have to nail it on the first night, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. To create that buzz. Very good doesn't cut it. <laughs> you know, you, you got to kill it. And, uh, so that was a triple header. Well, you named three, band, you three of the best bands night, ever. Three, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, same club for a festival, you know? Yeah. And you build the show around. Of course, I would be able to, but I had my, my, my buffer on that is I get really, really good local acts on the bill as well, you know? And running till 3 a.m. Anyway, the, the triple header was a, I mean, we did, uh, North Island just got their own booker in the coming years, and he ended up, he would be bringing acts to me, like Japanese Breakfast, like uh, um, who's the girl from Australia? Uh, Courtney Barnett. Yes, Courtney Barnett was a triple header. Yeah. Japanese Breakfast was a triple header. Um, yeah, the Zoo Bombs were the original triple header at CMW. I had to finance that whole one myself because those guys wouldn't put money into anything. And I said, okay. I'll do it myself. I made, you know, me and the Zubamas made some money from it even. Uh, but it was, we were way out on a limb. I remember you talk, coming into uh, Full Blast Records and us talking about that and you saying, like, I got a lot riding on this Zubamas show. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that was just <clears throat> they had played the um they had played oh well I did another thing I created when we we we, we um restored the sign. Like guys uh the guy who booed us out who bought the building and booed us out claimed to have restored the sign. So it is so it's this current guy. Well we were the guys oh, yeah. who restored the, the neon pump. Cost twenty G's. I was there. And I will. I will testify in court for you, Dan. I was there. I know you did this. Yeah, right on. And you know, um, I brought in. I so I created something called the Neon Palm Festival. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three nights to celebrate the return of the the sign. And I I had the zoo bombs once before. They were uh, with Ember Norton Records, and they were done at North American tour. And they'd absolutely blow me and Ben Rayner from Toronto star. We were just like frozen standing there saying, what the hell is this? You know? And the next move I made phoning them in Japan saying it's the one night in North America tour. <laughs> I flew them in to play the neon palm festival. And you know that that was going way more out in the limb than bringing uh, the uh, uh, the greenhorns in to open for the Sadies and the question mark. But uh, oh boy! Anyway, there was a there was a Hamilton man whose agent God, they have some uh, oh I can't remember the name, but they were big, but they were they were kind of on the downhill slide. But their agent. They were a brand name, and I had them on after the Zoo Bums for that show. And um, the Zoo Bums went up on stage. I had a guarantee for this band, like a $1,000. A band from Hamilton. I don't think it would God. be. Like not, heads right? like not Headstones or something. Not the Headstones, but something like that. Okay. And anyway, Zoo Bums go on stage, and these guys are getting hell their payment, right? Yeah. So they got to go on after the zoo bombs. So I was going stage. Forget about it. There's no following these guys. And they so killed it. <laughs> Andre Etze from the Deadly Snakes said to me, Dan, that's the greatest man I've ever seen. And the room emptied. And this Pendleton band. Oh, you know what? I'll look it up. I'll try to get a hold of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'll put it in the intro. And then... Get it to you after. Uh, they were, I mean, maximum five people stayed for their show. <laughs> and I felt really ripped off by the industry for paying, yeah, you know, the industry would come and get you for big guarantees and all that kind of stuff, you know. And oh boy, I like just dealing with bands straight myself, you know. Anyway, that was the Zoo Bombs. One Night in North America tour. So yeah, as a promoter, you gotta create things. You gotta bring something to the game too, not just like, okay, yeah, I'll make well, you know, good posters. That was something, but uh create a platform, you know, mm -hmm. make the show something bigger than just a run of the mill show. It's an event. It was always an, an event. event, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You got an it's an event rather than a show. So Pain events, yes, requires some imagination. Who who was like you mentioned Will Farrell earlier? Who uh, his when he was in Toronto that run that he was here for a while, some legendary stories of his partying. But who to you are some of the wildest partiers that you would meet in rock and roll <coughs> and, and and just in general the through this wildest. club stuff? Oh, there was a guy named Nicky Sutton, who was uh, from England. Rest in peace. And he was involved with Swell Maps yeah. and uh, uh, Kevin Jr. Oh, God, what was his band name? God, Kevin died young. Uh, Kevin, he was in a band from Chicago I worked with. Anyway, Nicky Sutton. And so it, it was, it was a, you know, fairly obscure, but interesting. It had a, uh, you know, there was had some sort of audience. Uh, uh, anyway, I, uh, wow, I partied with him. Well, we went back to, he had a room at the Grange Hotel and uh, we just doing coke and booze, you know, and uh, ARE weapons, me and those guys got pretty crazy. 
Yeah, because uh, you were also an early uh, champion I mean, I, of them, too, like before they kind of got that wave of hype. Yeah, I was swimming from you anyway. Oh, that was got that got a little complicated. We did so much coke at the end of the night. Stand, okay, yeah, we're gonna, you're going to pass? I swear to me, talk about me. We just spent about $500 worth of coke. Oh, uh, but you know what? Anyway, I just should have. I probably didn't lay it out as I should have, you know. Yeah. Bef- oh, God. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, I gave them some money. Their, their flights were paid for and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, transportation to the airport. And there's a little extra cash, but, uh, and, a, and a lot of coal. <laughs> um, and uh, the partying, wow. Um, I remember Robin Black doing a thing for Much Music. That'd be one of the first time Robin Black was ever on Much Music with you. And being like, the, and, and introducing you as, in, in the office of the Elmo, being like, this is the wildest party place in Toronto, or something to that extent. Well, yeah, I was interested, you know, between us, I, between me, you, and the listeners, <laughs> if, we, if we got any. Uh, yeah, Rob and Black, I, they, Rob and Black were pretty good, and I was pals with them. Uh, especially Stacey Strand, because we did a lot of partying together. And uh, he he's a terrific guy. <clears throat> um, and Rob and I like uh, Were they my favorite band? Or, no, I mean, in that genre, the Toilet Boys yeah. were, were, the, uh, <clears throat> were the greatest. Um, but I was into the glam thing, yeah. I bet. I, you listen, you're a booker. You've got to have, um, you know, it's like running a sports team. You can't have, uh, well, I wouldn't mind having 18 Mitch Marners, but, uh, you know, but you no, know, you, you need a, a, a balance, your roster. You need all kinds of stuff. You can't just book one genre. Yeah. Yep. You got to cover the waterfront, you know, Did, everything, you, the whole spectrum. Were you booking the, uh, the Elmo when the Rolling Stones played there again? <clears throat> No, no, they, no, they, uh, no, that was wave. That was 19. That was one of the reasons I was, um, I found the Elmo appealing because uh, it was one of the few things in Toronto that had any sort of history. Cause they played it again in like what, 90 something, right? Like, or two, <clears throat> that was at the uh, horseshoe. I remember the, the horseshoe, but then I thought they did an Elmo show. Maybe it was later on. No, they did. No, no, no. They did uh, uh, the Palais Royale. I remember the Palais Royale one too. I thought that I remember Ackroyd walking in. I, I don't. I didn't. Wasn't there? But anyway, it, there was never another Elmo. Okay, must be. Thank God, because the people who took over the Elmo after us would so we'd be totally undeserving of that kind of uh, uh, that kind of event. It got weird. No, it, now with now without Charlie Watts and everything, it's. It's the, the sun setting, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I was fortunate enough to see them um, their last time uh, someplace outside of Barry. It's the first time I ever saw them. Yeah, I... the band that turned me on to punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, this has been unbelievable. And anytime you want to come back, let's do one with Max from the Snakes. Let's do one with Danko. Because, you know, as I say, you've affected so many people's lives in this city and music, and you continue to. And My thank you, my favorite. Yeah, that, that, that's probably my favorite. Uh, and Jesus, he's sharp. Talk about, you know, I went to, when I was in, on that trip. No, the second trip to England, the nature of which will not be discussed. Yes. Uh, I went down to London when they, they were playing a bar fly and, uh, in Camden. And uh, oh boy, I got out of touch drinking. But Lemmy was there from Motorhead. I'd met him in uh, Toronto once before, too. Very nice guy, very friendly. <laughs> but I remember getting right up front when Danko played, and Rishi, in the middle of a song, looked down at me and winked. And I thought, man, that dude has got his shit. So down. It's so well rehearsed. It's so reflex, so pro that he's aware of what's going on around him. You know? Yeah. It, it, no, that is something. And that's something <clears throat> when people think of punk rock and stuff, you know, uh, it's just uh, loose and whatever happened. No, it's not. Uh, you know, 
it's sometimes spont spontaneity can be great. It happens a lot with you, but you're a master of that. Um, but there's a lot to be said also for honing your skills, you know? Yeah. And uh, and knowing how to surf that anyway, he can surf and look at you and wink at you at the same time. Oh yeah, he, you know? I've seen. I've like I've been on tour with him and seen like Duff McKagan and Duff McKagan turning to me and going, "He's the best front person ever." It's like, wow, you were in a band with Axl Rose and you're saying Danko Jones is the best front person ever. Like that speaks volumes. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know what? What was so interesting about uh, Danko Jones is they took the blues with a slightly tongue-in-cheek. He's a blues character, slightly tongue-in-cheek, wise guy, but it is, it's, 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 it's blues, it's hardcore meets blues rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or so, am, I, am, I, am I somewhat accurate? No, 100%. And have you heard that Garage Days thing that came out a couple years ago, of all the early recordings they did? And they've got a live track on it called Move On, which is one of my favorite songs I've ever heard. It's so good. And they never recorded it. It's that right, eh? Oh, it's so, it's like a slow ballad. And it's just, <laughs> like you're saying, it's a character, but there's so much honesty in that character that it makes it, I don't know, I, I just, I'm a huge fan. Oh, me too. Jeez. Well, good guy. Interesting guy. John Calabrese. I mean, there's Reese, but John Calabrese is a, Total cornerstone of that band too. Uh, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Two punk rock hardcore kids. Yeah, came and visited me when I was uh, in the coma at uh, St. Mike's, I guess it was. Yeah. Well, a, a, a gentleman, a gentleman, uh, John Calabrese. Oh, I'd like to run into him again someday. Well, let's do one with you, me, and Danko next time because this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for doing this, Dan. Okay, you're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, for coming on the show. And you heard right there, Dan will be back for a part two at some point in the future. And there's a lot of people that we could get on for that splits with Dan. Dan Danko Jones, there's there's lots of people and a lot more stories. I guarantee there's a lot more stories. Uh, that's it for this week's show. On the next episode of Turned Out a Punk, which is hopefully coming out later on this week, always are on the show. My buddies Molly and Alec are going to be here, and we have a... Another fun conversation. Comp people that have played shows for Dan Burke. But if you want to talk about a completely different Canadian music experience, you get that in all ways. But equally as fascinating and an incredible band. One of my one of my favorites. Every time Always comes on the radio, I'm like, oh my gosh. So happy for these kids. The kids are adults. I'm saying it because I knew them when they were little kids. Not little kids, but you know, like younger. Hey, we, we talk about it next week on the show. Well, that's it for me. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives and issues of indigenous peoples all over the world matter. We need to protect trans kids and help trans people protect themselves and their rights and stop hate and violence towards people of different religious faiths and uh, beliefs and races and just knock all this hatred out because we're not talking about political issues here. This is just basic freedom. This is basic human rights shit. People have the right to... Uh, the right and they deserve to be able to live free from hate and discrimination and violence so if there's organizations that are affecting positive change in the world around you get involved there's lots of stuff right now you can do there's lots of stuff it can be overwhelming at time to look around and see all the stuff that's going on in this world but if you if you do something i guarantee you'll feel a little bit better something's better than nothing right um so get involved. There's organizations that need your money, need your physical support, need your, I don't know, just, just get involved. Speaking of get involved, get involved in the punk scene. Start a band, start a fanzine, just do something because this culture gets better when you participate in it. Trust me on that one. And who knows where it goes? Who knows where you take it? Um, sign your organ donor cards because by the time they come looking for the, those organs, you don't need them. You don't. And it can perform miracles. I've seen it perform miracles with my own eyes. And try meditating. Who knows? It might help. I'll tell you one thing. Most of the people that come on this podcast that are very successful, I found they meditate. And even if you're not successful like myself, meditation can help. Oh, 
Well, that's it for me. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a good week. Well, hopefully less than a week, and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye.